This presentation is brought to you by the Colorado Neurological Institute Movement Disorder Center. Thank you for joining us for this installment of the Dystonia Patient Education video series. Deep brain stimulation is a new technique in which electrodes are placed into dysfunctional regions of the brain in patients with severe dystonia. This video reviews the basics of the technique and for whom this invasive therapy should be considered. There is a great deal of variability in the surgical technique to perform electrode implantation for deep brain stimulation. Different surgical teams approach the procedure differently due to their technical expertise and the equipment they have available. The specifics of the surgical procedure may also vary, depending on the nature and the severity of the patient's symptoms. Some patients undergo surgery under a general anesthetic, and others have surgery while they are awake. In some centers, surgery may be performed without electrophysiological cordings and simply with MRI guidance, where in other centers, Electrophysiologic microelectric cording is used and the surgery is performed outside of an MRI scanner in a standard operating room. A stereotactic head frame may be attached to the skull to keep the head stabilized during the procedure and also establish a three-dimensional space for all points in the brain to allow planning of the surgical approach to the target. Some centers perform surgery without using a stereotactic head frame and do this using a frameless guidance system with a surgical targeting device attached to the top of the skull to which a micro-targeting system is attached, allowing a microelectrode or the deep brain stimulating electrode to be driven to the target location in the brain. MRI scan is used to image the proposed target location and plan the trajectory through which the electrode will pass through the brain to reach the target. It is important to choose a path which reduces the risk of hitting a small blood vessel and as a result, the risk of intraoperative hemorrhage can be minimized. Depending on the surgical technique used, the MRI scan may be done on the day of the surgery with a frame applied to the skull or may be done preoperatively some days, weeks, or months before surgery if a frameless system is being used. Many surgical teams use microelectrical cording to help localize the specific location in the brain for implanting the final DBS electrode. Microelectrode recording involves using a much smaller electrode to record the activity of individual brain cells in the target area and also to localize surrounding structures to avoid. Microelectrical cording is usually performed with the patient awake and various limbs may be moved actively or passively with the response of individual cells recorded. Stimulation may also be performed through the recording electrode and adverse effects of microstimulation can also help in identifying structures near the target to avoid. The process of brain mapping may take on average one or two hours per side of the brain being examined. The following videos show how microelectrode recording can be used to localize these movement responsive nerve cells when in the surgical setting. You missed the response, and you can hear the cell firing when I move the wrist. It's a kinesthetic wrist cell. It's a beautifully... For the tactile area of the, of the VC nucleus of the thalamus, it's out there. So, it's activated just with the face brush, even. Works better if it's a little fresher. Yeah. Recordings are often performed by driving the microelectrode through multiple areas in the brain, and so multiple trajectories through the brain are mapped in order to find the area of the brain where cells respond appropriately to movement, suggesting that chronic stimulation in the region 
may improve dystonia, as well as to find areas in which stimulation produces minimal or no adverse effects. After the final stimulating electrodes are placed in the brain and fixed to the skull, the patient is sedated with a general anesthetic and the remainder of the deep brain stimulating system is implanted. The most serious complication is hemorrhage into the brain during surgery. This risk is approximately 1-2% to per side of the brain operated on and can have similar ramifications as a stroke, including difficulties with language, vision, paralysis, or even death. Infection may occur in up to 3% of patients and usually occurs in the first couple of months after surgery. Most infections involve the peripheral hardware and do not involve the brain. Commonly, the infected hardware can be removed and intravenous antibiotics administered. If the infection only involves the peripheral hardware and not the actual deep brain stimulating lead in the brain, the remainder of the system can then be replaced and the stimulation resumed. A variety of hardware complications can occur. Electrode migration is the most serious hardware complication, but it occurs rarely. This requires reoperation and typically reimplantation of a new DBS electrode, or less commonly, the currently implanted and migrated electrode may be repositioned without reimplantation. Other complications include breakage of the extension wire or short circuit at the connection between the extension wire and the pulse generator or the DBS lead. These can usually be identified by a process of electrical troubleshooting and x-rays of the DBS system. Replacement of the broken or short-circuited hardware can usually resolve these problems in a relatively simple fashion. Patients with cervical dystonia may be at a higher risk of fracturing the peripheral hardware due to the twisting and turning movements of the neck. Usually, the surgery to implant the deep brain stimulation electrodes results in a minimal hospital stay. In the absence of complications, most patients are able to leave the hospital in one to two days. If the remainder of the peripheral hardware is implanted on a separate day, such surgery can usually be performed as an outpatient. Activating the stimulation and programming the specific parameters appropriate for chronic stimulation usually begins one or two weeks after the electrode implantation to allow swelling around the implanted electrodes to resolve first. The FDA-approved deep brain stimulation systems include rechargeable pulse generators or non-rechargeable pulse generators. The lifespan of non-rechargeable systems varies substantially from patient to patient, depending on the current drain that occurs with the specific stimulation parameters required for an individual patient. For example, a higher current may be needed for more serious dystonic movements, thus decreasing the duration of the battery lifespan. On average, non-rechargeable systems last three to four years. Some pulse generators can be replaced easily with an outpatient surgery under IV sedation. Patients receiving rechargeable systems last for up to nine years, and as a result, surgical procedures may be minimized, especially in younger individuals with rechargeable systems. The pulse generator can be programmed to allow stimulation through a single or a combination of electrodes. Patients typically need to be repetitively examined during the process of programming in order to determine the parameters which achieve maximal benefit with minimal adverse effects. Stimulating on one side of the brain typically results in the greatest improvement on the opposite side of the body, or in other words, stimulating on the left side of the brain results in improvement on the right side of the body. However, Stimulation on one side may also, to a lesser extent, improve symptoms on the same side of the body. When stimulating in the globus pallidus, the typical transient adverse effects that need to be monitored include seeing flashes of light due to current spread to the optic tract, nausea, vomiting, 
or pulling of the arm, leg, or face due to current spread to motor fibers. During the deep brain stimulation programming, the stimulation frequency, pulse width, and amplitude of stimulation can all be selected. The onset of improvement following adjustment of stimulation parameters for patients with dystonia may be immediate within seconds or minutes, or may occur very gradually over hours, days, or weeks. As a result, the duration of time over which stimulation settings must be adjusted must be customized for the individual patient and may occur over days, weeks, or months. Deep brain stimulation is not a cure, but can substantially reduce symptoms of dystonia. Patients with primary generalized dystonia, such as those with genetic mutations in the DYT1 gene or who have idiopathic dystonia, improve on average by 60 to 90 percent. Patients with cervical dystonia usually see improvement in symptoms by about 50 percent. Secondary or acquired forms of dystonia, especially those in patients who have visible lesions in the brain due to stroke, trauma, or other neurodegenerative diseases, improve on average about 25%. An exception exists for patients who have tardive dystonia due to exposure to dopamine receptor blocking drugs, and these patients typically respond very well to deep brain stimulation.